welcome to Srishti webinars again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Vijay, and uh, I am from uh, Srishti Digi Life. We are uh, distributors and uh, uh, of many reputed brands in the industry. We handle uh, right from um, phase one cameras to um, the pro photo lights, the entire um, Vitex solutions of imaging solutions of the tripods, Manfrotto tripods, to Nat Geo bags, to everything. Now, Srishti though has always been in the field of uh, distribution and supply chain. We also want to um, bring a difference to the community in India and in the countries we are present in. We are also present in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Sri Lanka. Now, there are many amazing learning platforms, amazing schools in India, which provide great teachings. However, we always find that from our end, we want to do something to the back to the community. We want to give something back to the community. So we, we wanted to provide a holistic approach of, of uh, teaching to the community itself mm -hmm. so that it helps everyone by, I mean, no, it, it, it gives a kind of, uh, puts people into a self-improvement process and ultimately make them critical thinkers, creators, you know. So at the same time, I would also want to emphasize that, uh, I mean, take all these panelists as an inspiration and use that inspiration to draw your own theories and conclusions and, and create your own uh, um, visual stories, you know. So today's topic is about Photojournalism. I mean, in photojournalism uh, is in, in simple terms as a branch of photography that that uses uh, photos and images to tell a story. You know, today let us uh, go a little in depth and get our panelists to share their experience uh, about how uh, how they probably share these in, they probably shoot these intimate stories and how those intimate stories uh, storytelling from a distance may change moving forward or rather will it ever have a change now i do not have so much of uh, knowledge on this subject so i am not going to moderate this session and i am uh, leaving this to my able hands of leonard go and vivek marepan who are also uh, part of srishti group um, over to you leo um, and thank you for all the panelists for joining in today thank you thank you vijay Hi everyone, uh, my name is Leonard. So today I'll be moderating this session with my colleague uh, Vivek. So of course the topic today is actually telling intimate stories from a distance and we are talking about photojournalism itself. And we have five of India's best uh, photojournalists with us this evening itself. So we have Ashima, Smita, Prasanth, Somya and Ritesh itself. So before we actually dive into you know talking about the, the, the topic on hand itself, maybe what I'll do is I'll just walk through everyone about what's going to happen today. So first of all, um, I'm going to introduce all the, all the speakers itself, all right, all the five of them, and each of them will then follow by, each of them will follow up with a short presentation, all right, of their work. So this way, everyone in the group itself, you know, will have a better understanding of what each photojournalist's work is uh, focused on. And then after that, we'll follow it up with a moderated session, we'll have some questions for the speakers. But remember, at the same time, feel free, hit the chat box itself, all right, and, uh, and actually send us your questions. And at the end of it itself, all right, we're going to compile some of these questions, we're going to put it out um, to the speakers and try to have some answers on the spot itself. For some of you whose answers may not be answered itself, don't worry, all right, we'll still try to get them answered for you, and then we'll send you back the answers itself. All right, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to take up anyone's time itself right now. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Ashima. So Ashima shouldn't be a, a strange or foreign name to a lot of uh, budding photojournalists itself. So she's a freelance photographer and filmmaker, and she is also represented by National Geographic Image Collection. So in March 2017, um, Times actually included her on a list of 34 women photographers around the world to follow. And at the same time, she has worked on a diverse range of subjects, you know, that sent her looking for flamingos for Discovery Channel to actually climbing sail masks for National Geographic Traveler itself. I mean, she's pretty much an adventurer, I would say. 
And she's been twice nominated for a Green Oscar and the recipient for the Raman Gonkhan Nature and Environment Photographer in 2006. And in 2004, she was nominated all right, for the Commonwealth Photographer for South Asia itself. So that's Ashima. And next up, we actually have Smita. Smita is an independent award-winning photographer and her work primarily focused on human rights, gender, crime, and social issues itself. So the work of hers has been published in various publications like New York Times, BBC, Time, National Geographic. And she is also a Getty Image Grants grantee and IWMF reporting fellow itself. And in 2017, she received the Indian of the Year Award, an Exceptional Women of Excellence Award by Women Economic Forum in 2018. Just last year, she won the One World Media Awards for a film, Rebels with a Cause, at BAFTA, London. So her works itself have been shown in various countries, you know, including the UN headquarters in New York itself. So we are very happy to have Smita with us this evening as well at the same time. Thank you and for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Smita. Thank you, Smita. It's nice to hear another voice all of a sudden as well. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, next up, we have Prasan. So Prasan is a visual communicator and he works in the visual uh, sorry in the developmental development sector for news and assignment stories all across India. So his experience varies from working for news wires itself like Reuters, Bloomberg, Getty, to newspapers like New York Times, um, IHT, The National, to magazines like Forbes, Business Week, or non-government organizations like UNICEF, Save the Children, and of course other feature agencies itself. So today, the focus of his work for Prasan's work itself is actually on documentary filmmaking and photography. So he runs a production agency called J. Dot Productions and directs films for corporate social responsibility and international NGOs and news media itself. So that's Prasant. I think, uh, you know, this evening itself, we're having some really, really heavyweight photojournalists with us this evening. And uh, next up, we have Somya. So Somya is an independent photojournalist and she's based in Delhi itself and she contributes to the New York Times and National Geographic among other magazines. So her work focuses on gender and environmental issues and she was nominated for World Press Photo 6x6 Global Talent Program from Asia region in 2019. So she has built a diverse body of works spanning journalism and documentary genres of photography over the past six years itself and these works have been contributed to Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Guardian, and uh, Stern Magazine from Germany itself as well. And her works have been exhibited across the globe. And next up, we have Ritesh. So Ritesh is based in Bombay, and he began his career as an unpaid intern, all right, in the photography department of the Indian Express. And he has also worked for the Hindustan Times and Open Magazine. And over the past 15 years itself, Ritesh has witnessed and documented several major events all right, of national and international importance in India itself. Two years ago, in 2018, he has self-published his first photography book, The Red Cat and Other Stories, which is a bittersweet, ironic, or even a funny look all right, at the city of Bombay. So we have introduced the five speakers itself already, and I think um, for most of us right here, you know, um, being able to have such heavyweight uh, names in the photojournalism arena in India itself is, is one of our greatest pleasure. So um, I'm not going to go on speaking. I don't think people are, are sitting in front of the computers, you know, waiting to hear me speak. So I would like to actually invite each of the speakers to actually talk a little bit about your work as we play a slideshow for you. Now, sure. before I go, I would, I would request um, all of you to, to carefully listen to this a panel discussion because at the end of the session, uh, there's a surprise. Uh, we will announce a contest on photojournalism which has a cash grant of 25,000 rupees. So I will announce what is that contest about at the end of the session. But please, it's all about today's panel discussion. And um, uh, thank you, Leo. Please proceed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, sure. Thank you, Leo, for that introduction. And the two stories that I wanted to show today uh, were basically uh, based on the fact that I believe a lot of the participants here on this webinar are, are students. And I thought it might be interesting to show and talk about the first sort of photojournalistic story I shot. 
I've been a photographer for a very, very long time. I started in 2000, um, but I did many other things. I did celebrity portraiture, I did fashion, I did wildlife documentaries before I came into wanting to do photojournalism. And that was in 2013 when I felt I wanted to try something which was totally different uh, and new for me. I had been working as a photo editor for National Geographic Traveler India at that time. And therefore I had access and I had been looking at a lot of National Geographic archives and teaching myself by looking at images and trying to understand. So the first thing I did when I decided that I wanted to do a project was figure out what interested me. And with research, um, I looked at what were the visual elements of the story that I could pursue without a fixer or a magazine to back me and how could I gain access. I've always been interested in traditional crafts. So I thought that the handloom weavers of Varanasi uh, and how due to cheaper mechanized fabrics, the value of their work is being decimated um, and how they want to leave weaving and join schemes like Mandrega, et cetera, and how they are determined that their children are schooled so that the children don't follow in their footsteps. And that is this uh, next eight images is from the story on Varnas Weavers. And then this second story, it was done again out of my own interest in horses. In Manipur, we have one of the four indigenous breeds of uh, India. But more interestingly, Manipur is actually the birthplace of modern polo, uh, which many people don't know. Uh, yet because of you know, modern ways of living, people who had always kept ponies in their homes and they had a very elevated status in society. They were always used for religious processions or for sport or for war, never for everyday chores like farming, etc. They were now, they didn't have the means to look after them. So they're just releasing them onto the streets. The ponies were eating garbage, being hit by trucks and dying, etc. cetera. Um, I knew that this is not sort of a photo story that, many people would want really, but I did think it was interesting. Um, and I thought of how polo and the draw of international teams was being used to help in species conservation and cultural preservation. And uh, I had also worked at a travel magazine and I knew if I could give it the correct sort of spin and make it look like an aspirational place to visit, someone would bite, which they did. Um, so that's why I wanted to share the story because a lot of times people think photojournalism is about the news and the hard issues and you know but there's also a lot of cultural documentation that doesn't take place because people feel that it's not worthy enough uh, and that's why I wanted to show the story. It's the last image. Thank you, thank you, Ashima. So um, next up, we actually have uh, Smita. So Smita will be introducing a little bit about her works as well. Over to you, Smita. Sure. So I've added uh, two projects, uh, very different from each other, because I know there are many students who want to learn. And as Ashima had said, uh, photojournalism is not about the graphic images, but a lot more on uh, many times on the softer cultural stories. So um, the first project uh, is was an assignment that I did uh, for Human Rights Watch uh, a few years ago. Um, 
in the country called Central African Republic. So this is a landlocked country in the middle uh, of the continent, which is uh, right now at a civil war. The war started in 2012. And uh, there are two basically militias, uh, the Balaka and the Seleka, uh, Christian and Muslim, you know, uh, it's between these two militias. And what is happening is the people, the civilians, they are getting killed in, in between them. So uh, our job was to basically document the women who were kept as sex slaves and those who, uh, those who managed to run away. You know, so it was a hardcore, uh, very uh, intense assignment. And um, uh, the, the first thing that we did, that I, the conversation that I had with my editor was that I didn't want to show the faces of the women. You know, because just like India, there are many other countries where there's shaming and stigma. So if you can, if you look at the images, you'll see there are different ways in how I photograph them without revealing their identity. Uh, yet trying to make it look, you know, beautiful as much as possible. So these are uh, basically the women in the villages that we went to meet. And I also have uh, added a few other, like the UN peacekeeping corps in the middle of, this is a school, a public school, where a lot of people had taken refuge because their entire villages were burnt down. So we met a few women inside the school. So this is at a women's house with her child. This is a, a 50 year old woman whose uh, husband and son were killed. They were burnt alive in front of her and uh, she was gang raped and then taken as a sex slave. This is another woman. Uh, she was pregnant when she was taken by the militia and she was raped while she was pregnant. She suffered miscarriage. And at the end of her uh, stay, they put a beer bottle inside her and they asked her to run. So these are very hardcore, very tough stories and uh, very intense. Uh, but uh, I'm just grateful that I got to do this work and, you know, see the resilience and meet them. This is a child that was born when she was kept in, uh, she was in captivity. But she told me that, uh, uh, just go back, yeah. Uh, she said uh, when she was born, um, she did not want to pick up the child uh, because she remembered uh, what she had gone through, but over the years she has started uh, loving her child, you know. So this is, I've just added a few from that project. Uh, and uh, now this is the second story, uh, very different from the first one. So this is a story that I did last year for Odogon magazine. Uh, it is about this bird, a scavenger bird, which is five foot tall. So it's a really tall bird. And this bird has a reputation of uh, uh, being ugly. And uh, there's a lot of superstition attached to this bird. It's called, uh, scientifically, it's called the Greater Agedin Stork. And uh, currently, there are just 1,200 of them in the entire world. They existed from uh, Southeast Asia to uh, South Asia, you know, right from Pakistan to Laos. But right now, they, uh, you can find them only in the state of Assam in India, where there are 900 around, and a few in Cambodia. That's all they are left in the world. So... I documented these women who are called the Hargila army. So Hargila comes from the word, Asmi's word, bones follower, uh, because they, they, you know, they have flesh, the birds. So these are women from the villages who are working towards conservation of these birds and they're using cultural practices uh, as a means of uh, conservation. And uh, this is basically uh, just before the nesting period they have uh, a ritual which is called Pancharamit uh, in Asmis, uh, which means Godbharai or, uh, you know, what is that English word? I just completely lost. Uh, baby shower, sorry, baby shower. So this was a baby shower ceremony for the birds. And this is where most of the birds, uh, many of the birds you can find. This is the biggest garbage dump in India. It's called the Boragar landfill. And many of the birds, they were found poisoned or having plastics and toxins, and some were found uh, in a lake nearby. So these are the threats that these endangered species are going, you know, are facing. And this is again the Hargila army, you know, who is led by the biologist Purnima. Uh, so they are run, running different campaigns to raise awareness in the villages. The Hargila motive in the traditional Mekla. And in the front is Purnima. 
uh, who is the, you know, she's a green Oscar uh, uh, recipient uh, for, uh, for uh, creating the Hargila army. And uh, these are some of her uh, Hargila army members in the village. Thank you. Thank you, Smita. I think that was the, I think the, 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 the last story that you presented was actually very interesting and it contrasts very widely, you know, from the first story, from the first story that you have actually shown as well, you know, a very hard story itself, you know, and then from that transiting over to a story that's more about the culture of a place and talking about the, you know, how, how a creature is being represented and is trying to be uh, conserved by, by, by the people who love them itself. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So next up we have uh, Prasan. So for Prasan's Hi. presentation, it'll be a little bit unique. So just hang on and we'll just, uh, Prasan, would you like to take over and, and talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Hi. So I um, would like to uh, digress a bit from the traditional image, uh, which is associated with you know, one image telling the whole story as a photojournalist. So what photojournalism entails today? So uh, we can just hold this here uh, for I, in this, this is just a link, and I'm going to share this link and another link on the, you know, the chat, which everybody can see later. I'm not I'm going to talk about this story. Uh, this is a story I did last uh, November in um, uh, uh, in the Nubrali Valley on the politics of uh, the Indus uh, water. You know, it's a it's a nature of interest story. But as a photojournalist today, I'm not only expected to do photography, but there is filmmaking, there is audio, there is interviews, there is B-roll for the films. So from one trip, which in traditionally maybe in 2007 or 10, I would have gone, I would have just shot photos and there would have been a presentation of photos here. I want to show you what happens when we go as a, a photojournalist today. So this is kind of an example of it. Um, it's, it's, uh, so can we scroll now? Yeah. Yeah. So as we go, so that was the first shot. So uh, what they expect out of us is that as we shoot, we take small, you know, 15 second clips. Not only that, they want to make a video out of these clips. So this is just a clip from the water. So I, you know, traditionally uh, never carried a GoPro, but now I carry GoPro, uh, waterproof GoPros, you know, so I can put in water, you know, shoot in difficult conditions like this. So it's just a, you know, it's a loop of a video that just, you know, uh, comes in between a presentation like this. Uh, and lo um, almost every organization that shoot for today, nowadays, I do photo, video, clips, as well as interviews and, you know, follow up stories, find stories sometimes. So as a photojournalist, you know, it's just not restricted anymore to, you know, uh, traditionally photojournalism was defined as F8 and be there. You know, so I think you've come a long way from that today. So this is what I want to show. You can keep scrolling now uh, to the next. Uh, so, so they can use maps, they can use words. These are photographs. There's another video shot now. I have learned to use the drone because it gives a very global perspective to the show shoot, you know. Uh, I have a little bit of vertigo and every time I can climb tankies. So the drone has helped me a lot. So I do photos, videos with the drone. So both you will see here. So, you know, uh, this is a video of a scientist, uh, just part of the bigger narrative of the video, uh, where if the zone drone comes back, there's a scientist actually taking readings below. If, uh, if it is not skipping or dragging in your windows, please read this link on your own uh, screens later. It's an open link. Um, yeah, so he's taking readings there. So, you know, uh, relevant shots of, you know, storytelling shots, which uh, you have to think like a filmmaker, you have to think like a, you know, a storyboard artist scripting. Uh, a film when you're shooting. So there's always a beginning shot you think of, an end shot you think of, a middle. Um, uh, you have to think, you have you got all the nuances of the story uh, in photographs, in video, in interviews. You can keep going. Uh, so, you know, you can see these are photographs again. Now we have entered into homes of people. Uh, this is a person we interviewed. Uh, that's a traditional, you know, uh, chula in their house and, you know, what they are facing here. This is a drone photo and then there are videos also. And then her house was here, which is what, you know, what uh, flash floods had taken the house away. Um, and then of course, uh, photographs of beautiful landscape of Nubra and Lay. You know, and then we come to the small, uh, you know, it's a two minutes, 48 second video that they have made out of the, out of the, uh, you know, the whole package I had sent them. If this can be played even for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, that'd be good. 
So the usage of text, video, photos, there's a whole package that we give. So, and I had gone to the shoot alone. So I don't have assistants. I don't have other people with me. It's just, a, you know, there's an interview shot in their temperatures. And that is impacting the water resources in this area. Yeah, it is showing the instantaneous values of various other parameters. You can see different data. So those are archive footages from, I had collected from the scientist. So, you know, then, then uh, you have to understand what are the nuances of the story, you know, some wildlife. I went one day early morning to get the wildlife shot because it was part of the story was mentioning its impact on the wildlife. I just got a few Ibexes, but not, not really wildlife. And, you know, some shots like these, uh, which are uh, the border areas between China and India. So it's part what I would like to emphasize from this uh, this thing that I'm showing right now is that you're no longer just a image maker, but a holistic storyteller, and that's what it has become today. Yeah, so that's why uh, I think the links will you know show you more of uh, these things much more clearly, and the caption is going in. This is just a presentation, but this is how it is done now. Yeah. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next we have uh, Somya. Yes. Uh, the work that I decided to show today is about the documentation that I've done with regards to uh, COVID, which is happening right outside our houses right now. So when the Indian government declared a nationwide lockdown amid fears of spread of COVID-19 on 24th of March, it also urged people to stay put wherever they were. But for a huge migrant population, staying put was not an option. City life was difficult to afford without any source of income, and thus began a journey homewards. People set off on foot and bicycles to travel long distances, in some cases thousands of kilometers, for the safety of a roof over their heads and two square meals a day. I traveled almost 1,200 kilometers over eight days around the capital of India's most populous state, Uttar Pradesh, to find people walking, cycling, and hitchhiking their way home. They were set on a journey to distant villages in neighboring states, and some even to the neighboring country of Nepal, traveling for days with meager food and resources. I visited an isolation center housing 109 quarantine migrants who were found traveling to another state in one truck. In the villages, meanwhile, the government's relief in the form of free supply of 5 kgs of rice per individual and nominal monetary payouts attracted crowds observing and defying the norms of social distancing. A web of health workers, including ashas, paramedic workers, lab technicians, etc., are tirelessly reaching out to citizens in large numbers to ensure awareness and restrict the spread of virus. Eventually, India's millions of migrants were consider considered when the government announced special trains and buses to transport them home. The current lockdown highlights the inequalities in a country that are exaggerated in times of COVID-19, making communities vulnerable to being impoverished as well as infected. Uh, this was an assignment that I was commissioned on by National Geographic. And, uh, uh, you know, the way we work on assignments now, and uh, taking forward to what Prashant has said, we as photojournalists are not just clicking photographs, you know. We're charting our entire plan, our entire stories, and deciding what the storytelling will be like. So the way photojournalism is practiced today and the blurring lines between documentary photography are photo and photojournalism are very real. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. So uh, the last uh, panelist that we have is actually Ritesh. Hi, thank you for having me. And I think uh, I think there's very little space for me to say uh, anything about my work now because I've seen such wonderful, uh, I mean, I can't even call it work. I mean, the, the, this was so much more deeper than work. So I'm going to show you some pictures which are basically the most conventional form, you know, 
so to speak of uh, photojournalism news photography you know graphic images and nothing is planned uh, places where one has no idea what is going to happen next and these are images of a terror attack that happened in bombay in 2008 and um, we can see the images and uh, the thing is that i had actually no business being there and uh, one but one of the golden rules of being a photojournalist is that you consider yourself like a modern historian so if anything happens you uh, you know you uh, you just show up right you 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 find your way around so um, i was at a cafe and i was watching you know tv uh, on the screen and i read a little bit about a gang war happening you know? these are the images of that night and uh, i almost got shot twice uh, uh, which was you know uh, a bit of a scary affair but yeah these are like um, you know this is like the whole unplanned nature like i had i had no idea what i'm getting into i had no idea what so um that's an image of someone flashing their cell phones uh, asking to be rescued and most of the images are self explanatory and um, you can have a look at them on my website as well and you know i wish like i had lighter gear at that point in time so that i could move a little faster make faster decisions because you also have to think of not only safety not only the story but you also have to think of aesthetics and i wish you know cameras would become a little lighter uh, as we go forward and yeah i mean these are fairly standard images uh, it's uh, it's it's just that i'm showing these for the nature of risk that is involved sometimes in the job and you know a lot of uh, like even even me i uh, when i when i started out i used to think that you know i'll be a photographer i'll shoot conflict i'll shoot strife and things like that it's not really easy and it tends to take a mental toll on you as well so uh, i mean later in life i found ways to deal with all this but you know there's a lot of ad adrenaline floating around that can you know suck you into a, a very very negative space that's the last image for you thank you thank you ritesh thank you i think that was the yeah. that was a very insightful look into the genre of photojournalism itself as well and i think this evening itself we have i have a souvenir from that day which is a small little bullet shell that i carry with me so i think i think i think i think you know based on the the five uh, panelists that we have we have seen a very diverse uh, group of works itself ranging from soft to hard stories itself so um i actually like to actually go into the uh, moderated session itself so i would like to actually pose the first question to smita so um one of the questions that i always have for photojournalists is how do you actually prepare yourself before an assignment or reportage itself do you actually write about the subject first and then you know look for the images or do you look for the images first before you actually start writing on the story itself so uh, when you mean assignment basically it's you are assigned to do a job by some publication or by an editor uh, okay. and i think your uh, what you mean to say is that how do you seek to do a project of your own right uh, am i right yes yes so um, i think you know the first thing is are you curious about it uh, anything it can be the tea gardens of somewhere a coffee plantation somewhere it can be just uh, you know how garbage is treated in 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 our country it can be any kind of subject it can be also you know documenting your parents at home during covid um, it can be a very personal story but uh, first thing is that do you care about it enough to stick to it or uh, are you thinking that okay i want to work on this because i want this to get published yes all of us want our work to be seen uh, to be published but if you don't care about it uh, i don't think you should take up anything on your own uh, i'm not talking about assignments because there are assignments sometimes we do that uh, you know you do it because you have to pay the bills right okay uh, yes have i answered your question uh, or well Well, Smith. I mean, I mean, you know, we we got the last part itself on on assignments itself. You know, um, so let's say you're being assigned, you're being contacted for an assignment itself, and you're being briefed on uh the story matter, the story subject, and all that. But let's assume that when you're out on the field itself, all right, and through your eyes itself, you realize that hey, 
what I'm seeing is actually very different from the brief. How will you actually approach that then? Will you actually try to convince the editors who who's handed you the job that, you know, your brief was actually not accurate? Or, you know, would you actually follow the brief itself to show that side of the story? That's a very good question, actually. Uh, often we are given a job and when we go on the ground, things, as you said, uh, unfold in front of us. You know, what Ritesh was talking about, he was sitting at a cafe and something happened. Uh, you know, he was not prepared for that night. He didn't know what was happening. So uh, sometimes we go to a particular place uh, and uh, something else happens. So uh, I think as photojournalists, the first thing is to uh, use your instinct. Our instinct is very strong. So follow your instinct. Uh, if the story uh, deviates, as you said, uh, and if you don't have time to, uh, you know, to uh, communicate with your editor, I think you should just go for it. Follow your instincts and just go and shoot. Uh, because at the, at the end of the day, what matters is the story uh, and what you shoot and whether it makes sense or not. You know, And uh, you can mm -hmm. always communicate with your editor at the end of the day that, hey, I went there. Uh, I was supposed to photograph this woman, but she was not at home. But instead, I spoke to the neighbor and this is what the neighbor said. And then she took me to the spot where uh, there was a murder last year. And then blah, 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 you know. So you follow that lead and you document that. So uh, editors are, I mean, Ashima was an editor. She can throw more light on this. But editors are always happy uh, when you come back with something. It's always better to come back with something other than come back with nothing. You know what I mean? And um, mm. use your sixth sense, use your instinct. And uh, if you're given a job, try to do it. If things change, then follow that change. Go for it. Okay, all right. I think that's I think that's a that, that's a very interesting answer. Um, interesting in a good way because um, uh, there there have, there have always been um, stories of photojournalists itself, you know, who uh, just follows the brief, and then at the same and then after that, you know, their colleagues will actually look at them and say, "Hey, when you were there, didn't you manage to see this this other things that's happening on the side? Uh, did, did you actually get a story on those things as well?" And then Everyone just realized that the, photo, the, the journalist himself or herself was just looking at the brief and say, okay, I'm, I'm just supposed to do this and, and this is what I'm going to document, you know, and, and that becomes, you know, a little bit of a tunnel vision. So I, thank you, Smita. I think that was, uh, that was an interesting insight itself. Uh, the next question I have, uh, I'll actually like to put it across to Ashima. Hi, Ashima. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, okay, so, all right. So, uh, Ashima, a question for you. So, when you're making your initial contact with a potential subject, what kind of relationship um, are you trying to establish? Um, so, often, it's not that you make contact with the people that you ultimately shoot. Uh, everyone will work in different ways. Uh, I haven't actually ever really worked with fixers and people like that I think a lot of it that's a different process um, you know so if there's somebody on the ground that you know who can get you access because ultimately that's what you want you need to just get access to your subjects and often you aren't approaching them directly because perhaps they might not have the means to be contactable or you might not whatever it is so you just find like a lot of a lot of times I um, find like an organization or I look at, uh, I research people who are working in that field or like, you know, for example, the, the Manipur story, the horse story, is that I found somebody because, because I have horse contact, <laughs> I have horse contacts. Yeah, that's something. I, through my horse contacts, I found out like, who is there in Manipur? And then somebody said, oh, why don't you try this one, that, you know, so it's just, if you have an interest in something, you will always find someone who can put you onto another person, put you on. And that's how I work personally. It's always through a point of reference. Um, and then you get, you get there and you try and uncover and you try and figure out more people once you get there. But you need that one solid person or one solid organization who can 
uh, whom you speak to and you understand, okay, well, there is something visual that I can come and shoot. Uh, and that's how I do it. Okay. But um, let's say that uh, after you have, you know, after you found your fixer who has managed to get the access to the subject for you. So when you talk to your subject for the, for the first time, you know, do you want, do, I, how, do you, how do you portray yourself? Do you portray yourself as someone who is there to tell a story of theirs? Or do you portray yourself as a friend, you know, to them itself, just to have better access, maybe? I mean, hopefully one portrays themselves as who you are. And part of who you are is what you do. So okay. everyone, you know, you're going in, very often, I mean, you're going in with a camera and so they know that you're coming in for photography and you just try and explain what you're, what you're doing, why you're there. And, uh, you know, things sort of tend to unfold. I find that uh, cameras in general, um, and I'm not, I'm not talking about crisis situations or conflicts and protests, those are different things. But in the work that I do, people tend to be very curious about me uh, coming into where they are with a camera and why, why do I, what's interesting about their situation. And often that's the question I'm asked, you know, that, but this is all normal. Why are you coming here? You know, and so you just try and say that this is, this is why I'm here. I think that this is interesting. This is what I do. Uh, you know, I now with mobile phones, it's really good that you can actually show them these are the types of things I do. This is my work. This is my family. I do that often, you know, because they also need to see who I am, where I'm coming from. Um, and that's re it's not, hopefully it's not a, like a portrayal. It's just who one is. Um, and that's really what you're trying to do. You're just trying to go in and be who you are. And that's what mm. you see. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ashima. <laughs> Thank you so much for the answer. Uh, Vivek, maybe would you like to uh, carry on with it? Yeah, so my question, I'll post it to Prashant. So, hi Prashant. Hi, so yeah. yeah. So while going through a project, you were talking about how uh, news is being consumed digitally a lot in these days. So my question will be about that. So in these times of news becoming consumed digitally a lot during these times, what are the opportunities and challenges that a photojournalist faces when covering a particular story or even delivering it to a news agency. Okay. Um, so uh, there is actually different kind of photojournalism that are running in this group. I just want to like define that first. Okay. So there is the daily news, then there is feature magazine, which is a temporary weekly thing. And then there is this long format. Uh, I think Smita and Ashima will fall in that category of, you know, how do they deal with subjects and how do they get into their, uh, you know, for a story and then pitch it to magazines and sell it. So there are different, different ways, right? So I am an assignment photographer. I have never moved from that position in my life. There, I am called, I am like this, you know, uh, in Game of Thrones, there's a word called sales word. So the highest bidder and the first, first bidder, you know. So I just wait with my cameras in the morning. Whoever tell me, go. I just go that day, you know. And I just keep shooting whatever is the call of the shoot. If they are falsifying information, I will say, I don't think that the story is true, answering the previous question, and I would take the brunt of it, whatever it comes my way. But that's my personal ethics that comes into play right there. Having said that, uh, the world changed. 2007, when I joined photojournalism, the first four megapixel camera was handed to me, uh, which I could not crop. And if I had gone to 400 ISO, I would get a mail from my editor saying, no, this cannot be done. Right, so we started that. I was born the digital era. I think some of people here have shot even analog. Uh, so I'm not the right person to ask about that world, which is also a crazy great world. All our uh, inspirations are there. Uh, we just are, uh, you know, doing the aftermath of those inspirations. So a uh, lot of good work has happened in analog. And now in digital era, what's happening is that we are dealing with a swipeology environment. You know, everything is a swipe. A video is a swipe, and a photo is a swipe. It's no longer resting on an image, reading an image, noticing, it's just entertainment for 3.5 seconds or 0 0.8 seconds in photograph, 3.5 seconds in a TikTok video, and that's about it, and then you're off to the next job, right? So that's the problem. The consumer has changed, and their thought process has changed, so the media organizations are grappling with that change. But as a photojournalist, I'm doing the same thing. 
it's the output which is being formulated in different ways. My ethics are in the same place. My approach is similar. My thought processes are very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, crystal clear that this is what I would do. And yes, I need to adapt my equipment maybe. Maybe my, uh, you know, the way I carry my gear. Uh, for different kind of shoots, carry a little different gear. So those kind of decisions you have to make as a digital photojournalist. And there is another aspect of it, filing, right? So photojournalism is about timing. You file the same. So I, I, I remember, you know, uh, Ritesh in the cafe, I was sitting with you before you ran to that assignment, uh, which I went later in the barista. So, you know, so it's not, I was not worried. I didn't go to the, you know why? Because I didn't have my laptop. I went home. Because I know once you're there, then you need a laptop to file. You need to send them it. The digital era has got this craziness of 6 p.m. deadline, Indian 9 p.m. deadline, some other country, 4 p.m. Australian. You know, you are just thinking deadlines when you're shooting as a photojournalist. Uh, I got a cover uh, in a big magazine in that shoot because it was a Wednesday and I kept shooting verticals because Thursday's magazine's shut. So I knew this, so I kept shooting verticals and nobody had a vertical on a Wednesday evening of, uh, you know, a terror attack. So I'm just thinking that these kind of knowledge helps you formulate the deadlines and stuff. So digital era has given us these kind of changes in the way we work, right? And now on top of it, I file now quick images for dissemination for Twitter and all from the Wi-Fi of my camera onto my phone. I edit on my Lightroom on my phone and I'm sending loaders to the editors. It's on their uh, Instagram and social media pages before even I leave the shoot. So I'm in a shoot and there are five images that's gone to the editor without caption, without anything for the time being. So they are live. So their curiosity is satisfied and then I have a half a day to file after that. So it's changed. The way you work has changed. But what you do has just, I don't think those ethics can change uh, too much. It's just consumables, the way it is being eaten by people or you know consumed by people. Because I think news media and now newspapers, I, everybody knows it's not there in the format it was even 2005, six when I started. So it's changed a lot. The whole world has changed to online and, you know, quick dissemination. So that's what I think is uh, the way forward, I guess. So as you were saying, like, uh, the content remains the same, whereas the form just keeps on shifting. Can we take it into that? Yeah. So also we have to work into different uh, mediums as well, not just yes. photos. Yes. Okay. Yes. So my next question would be to Soumya. So Swami, as we looked into a project about the migrant workers that you're covering right now for Nat Geo. So I want to ask you, like, uh, what kind of impact do you think that uh, this particular work has brought onto this particular issue? Uh, uh, thank you, Vivek, for the question. And I would actually want to start with where uh, Prashant left. I think... Uh, one, so I started working, I started my photojournalism, photojournalism career as a newspaper photographer. So my first job was at Hindustan Times. And that was the time when they were trying to take digital big towers. Uh, for me, as a photojournalism was so much more about storytelling than just the immediacy of what was happening. Uh, so while, you know, I was doing assignments and if they had to go into print, uh, the designer would tell me there's three column space and we just need a photograph that fits into that space. What digital allowed me for was it gave me a lot of space, you know, in digital, if you have five photographs, the editors are like, sure, you know, visuals are consumed more on digital and let's, let's do that. But I wanted to add uh, with respect to that. Uh, coming to photojournalism, I think, so I've been trained in documentary photography and street photography until I realized that these weren't the genres where I could make money. And because I had to pay my rent, I needed to find a way to earn. So that's when I decided to come into photojournalism. Now, when you come into photojournalism, somewhere at the back of the mind, you think you're going to change the world. You know, it's, it's the most inevitable thought that comes to your mind and six months into photojournalism and you realize that you're not going to do any of that because when I was working in the newspaper, my daily assignments were shooting weather, was, uh, photographing, uh, you know, protests, broken roads, sewers. And I was like, I don't care about what the uncle sitting in a fancy house 
in South Delhi things about Delhi, you know, I thought that there were going to be more socially relevant stories that I'm going to work on. But I think over a course of your career in photojournalism, you realize that there's a lot of petty assignments you do, but then what makes your career worth it? Are those assignments you've changed? Uh, taking it from there, I think when I'm doing an assignment like this for National Geographic, you know, I don't know, I think as a photojournalist or journalist, a lot of times you don't know what's the direct impact you've achieved. You know, you just wish that you've achieved a lot of it. There are places and there are stories which do uh, achieve direct impact. Like, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but Barkhad Dutt did this video of this old lady at the Mumbai, uh, at one of the Mumbai railway stations outside one of the uh, Mumbai railway stations who'd been uh, you know let out of the house by her son and the son said take care of yourself I don't want you home and then there was a follow-up video on that today whereby someone had decided to adopt the Dadi Leelawati is her name so somebody decided to adopt Leelawati Dadi and now she has a home and I think that kind of journalism is the kind of wish and the kind of hopes that we all have out of the stories we do but what I do know that all the stories and all the reportage that has happened around migration and around COVID in the country has, has pushed the government to work in the direction of starting the trains, you know, having to pay more attention to what's happening. You know, the governments could pretend till a point of time that they're really doing what they're doing. And then you realize that, you know, in a lot of ways, when the governments are dealing with it, they're dealing with maybe the elite India or they're dealing with people, you know, they, they have the money to get or they have the intention to get people from other countries back to your own country who's stuck there. But if they don't have the intention of sending the people who stuck in the cities, who the city builders back to their homes when, you know, they, when there's no way for the works like these uh, push the governments to do. And I, I do hope and I do wish that, you know, all the stories that we're telling have in some way contributed to uh, the way governments are responding. Thank you, Somia. So I have a follow up question on that. So you were saying like you started as a documentary photographer and then you moved on to the photojournalism. So do you want to talk about that line between shifting between the documentary, photojour for documentary photography and photojournalism? So how do you think they are different and how, they are, how do they complement each other in a way in your work? Uh, I think Ritesh uh, did point out to that when he was uh, talking about, you know, the story that he did. And, you know, those were also the times when photojournalism traditionally was about the single image. But over the years, it's moved on to the space of storytelling with more than one image where you can dwell longer into images. And that's where I think the boundaries between documentary and photojournalism have kind of blurred. While documentary photography basically needed the photographers to be invested in stories over longer periods of times and take out the nuances in the story, which was, you know, which was kind of the other end of photojournalism because in photojournalism, we always have deadlines and we're always supposed to file uh, images constantly. But for example, I was lucky that when I was working in Hindustan Times, we had uh, so another thing that I want to bring up here is that the reason that a lot of Indian publications will not have very heavily invested uh, resources and people into photography is because I do find that the visual literacy in India is not that great. But uh, when I was working in the, with the editor-in-chief of the newspaper who really understood visuals and who really pushed for it. So, you know, there have been times in, uh, like in Hindustan Times, we did this series where we followed uh, these students who just entered class 11. What are the troubles that uh, children face while they're going through the process of education in government schools? So we decided to follow them over a period of one year, and which practically meant that for at least a week in a month, we were just hanging around in the schools, which is not the kind of luxury you have in photojournalism. Like Prashant would tell you that, and Ritesh would tell you that, who've been into you know mainstream jobs, full-time jobs. That you know you you I mean you're lucky if you get two days for an assignment. And here I was spending a week full stories that we got out of it. You know, like I was just hanging around in the field while there was a lunch break that that was happening, and one of these girls came to me and she said, 
Didi, are you a Hindu or a Muslim? And I was surprised. I said, who taught you that? She said, no, all of us in the class know who is Hindu and who is Muslim. I said, how is that? She said, because the Hindus sit in one side of the class and the Muslims sit in the other. So we went to the principal and we said, what was that? You know, we, we didn't really understand what that was. And it turned out that because the third language, uh, these guys would choose the third language. So some of them had selected Urdu and some of them had selected Hindi. So based on that selection of language, the students were divided on where they were sitting, which eventually became a Hindu versus Muslim thing. You know, so those were the kind of amazing stories we could then think of doing when we had the luxury of time in photojournalism. Thanks a lot for that, Sonia. Thank you. So I have a question to Ritesh. So Ritesh, regarding uh, when you were showing your work, you were saying like the shooting the uh, 9-11, uh, sorry, 20, Mumbai a terror attack and then following up on this photojournalism assignment. 26, they, yeah. 26, yeah. And they do affect you in a certain way. So when you, when you are engaging in these stories up close and in the feed, how do they affect you and how do you let them, let it reflect in your work or do you not let it reflect in your work? So there are various uh, levels to this. One is first you identify the problem and for a number of years, because you're in a reasonably macho profession surrounded by a lot of men who do not talk about these things, it's considered, you know, a sign of weakness if you talk about or if you, you know, a number of times I've felt, you know, a little teary eyed at assignments and things like that. And you have to conceal it so that you, you know, people don't see it. The first thing is to identify that you are being impacted by it. And it takes time. It takes time given the kind of environment that you're in. Second thing is to, uh, I would, you know, I've made suggestions to the press club in Bombay also that we should have a counselor on call. Somebody who, you know, who's not really connected to the profession as such, but somebody who has an outsider's perspective and is equally connected to reality in some way so that you can at least talk because uh, it's not just these assignments, it's other assignments also, you know, there are, you know, like, you, there, you know, there's a gamut of things that you do when you're a newspaper or a magazine photographer. And uh, I don't know, I you, you have to be like a jack of all trades. So you can shoot sports in the same day, you can shoot a, a press conference in the same day. And by the end of the night, you're covering a building collapse or something of that sort, you know. So you go through these varied emotions through a day. And then, you know, uh, in my case, 2015 was, uh, th there were like key turning points, 2010, 2015, 2018. These were like very, you know, um, things that impacted me personally. And whatever impacts you personally is going to impact your style, is going to impact the way you, you know, look at photographs, the way you read photographs. Um, so, I mean, I think the simplest, coolest, easiest way is to talk about things, is to talk about things to your friends, to your peers, to counselors, to your family. And I keep my, you know, family reasonably involved, you know, and uh, I don't keep them like uh, hidden away from where I'm going or whatever. And uh, yeah, man, just take care of the basics. Take a look, you know, um, uh, I found working out to be a great thing. You know, it's it's a very cliched thing that you... Uh, you know, uh, go to the gym and, you know, but it really helps. I mean, you know, uh, uh, um, I, 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 I don't really have like, uh, you know, too many uh, tips and tricks to deal with this besides just facing it, besides just acknowledging that it happens. And it's happened a number of times to me. And each time something has happened, I've taken help for it. And I feel that uh, everybody who's, you know, uh, because I've seen what has happened to my seniors, because I've seen uh, what has happened to a lot of photographers is they've turned extremely, extremely bitter. And um, that shows in their work, that shows in the way they deal with their, you know, families and friends, or a lot of them are stuck to, you know, alcohol, uh, all sorts of dependencies. So I think if you try to, uh, you know, I think even if organizations come into it, you know, Say that, okay, you've done like two, three years on the job. Maybe do you want to talk to someone? Do you want to like, you know, um, that will also help in, you know, uh, making people understand what it really takes to be on, you know, behind a camera. Because right now there is this whole pedestal that photographers are put on. 
I don't mean photojournalist, documentary, etc. Everybody's put on a pedestal, you know, that, oh my God. You're... So uh, I think that will also bridge that gap and, you know, address things related to visual literacy. And um, yeah, I mean, that uh, I hope that answers you. So I have another question as well. So uh, yeah. when you do get into such situations and you need a break from your mainstream photojournalist work, so mm-hmm. is that the kind of time where you uh, like squint to your personal works, start doing personal projects for yourself without mm-hmm. any pressures? And maybe, like you, you, you published a book, which is yeah. which is quite quirky as well. So which everybody should, and I don't know how many of you have seen it, but <laughs> yeah. No, go on. Sorry, I was just being no. I, I just that's about it. So, uh, do you think that would help a lot? Like, if you if you do uh, switch into your personal work from your mainstream work. So the thing is, that both both have to go on together. Both have to go on together, and that's how I've approached things uh, since a very long time. That uh, my professional work feeds, you know, takes care of whatever uh, you know my needs are, and uh, the thing is that. You know, evolution happens in your style, in your work, in your approach to situations. And uh, a lot of times you can't deploy that in in the assignments that you do. So what do you do with it? So uh, you find you find a topic to work on, you find something to do, and uh, that's where you deploy it fully. And that's what I did. I mean, I worked on the book for four years. I did some really terrible assignments because they were paying me a lot but uh, I had to do it and uh, yeah but the good thing is that now I'm at zero I have no idea what I'm going to do next you know it's not like you can rest on the laurels of some award you may have won like in 2008 2009 or whichever year or you can't you know uh, how much can you flog a book okay Uh, so uh, the good thing is that it, you you reach a stage of renewal. You reach a stage of like absolute cipher, and yeah, it might just lead to something good, or I might become a stockbroker. Thanks a lot. Ritesh. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, do you want to take All right. Sure, of course. So um, one question I have, um, I would actually like to put this across to Somya. All right, Somya. So um. Actually, for most of, uh, even though the question is posed to Tomia itself, you know, uh, for the rest of the panelists, if you have something that you want to, 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 to add on, you know, by all means, feel free to. Uh, but to Tomia itself, you know, do you feel like the ethical lines of photojournalism are being crossed um, these days? Because, you know, we're living in an image frenzy world and news are being sensationalized to get more views. So do you think that there are some ethical lines these days that are being crossed now? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, there's certainly an overflow of imagery and there's certainly a lot of imagery out there and a lot of misinformation which we do not know we should believe or not because for a lot of them, we don't know what the sources are. But I think... In that space, the work that photojournalists do becomes even more important. I don't think there's an issue of ethics in in terms of misrepresentation in photojournalism per se, as much as there is in terms of when it gets, let's say the WhatsApp university, like uh, Mr. Ravish Kumar calls it. But uh, I think which is why the work of photojournalists has become even more important in this day and time. And uh, the responsibility on our shoulders is even uh more uh you know even more because we really need to show what's out there uh, earlier in the year we you know india was torn by the protests against caa and i think a lot of us would agree we were blown away by the kind of misinformation there was you know it kind of categorized media into very different sides and depending on which media you followed you knew what will the opinions of the person would be like So, you know, at that point of time, I wasn't particularly commissioned by anyone, but it was more of a personal thing that I was seeing this happen in my country and I did not know how to respond to it, you know. And then a a few days when I kept seeing what was happening and how things were happening, I realized that as a photojournalist, all that I can do is do my responsibility, which is go out there and document what was happening. 
So when I started documenting the CAA protest, I just started putting everything out on uh, my social media, you know, because I thought that it was important to put out that information in that kiosk of vices and, uh, you know, misopinions that there were out there. It was even more important for us to continue doing what we do. Okay. So, so with regards to that itself, so do you see photojournalists um, being a mouthpiece for the objective truth? Mouthpiece for the objective truth. Okay. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you tell me what you mean by the objective so, truth? Are you saying that? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, I know. We are, we are, we're kind of digging you know, a, a little bit deeper into this session itself right now. So... You know, based on what you have said, you know, uh, you went down, you went to document thing, and then you went to post the images on your social media itself to inform your followers of the realities that's happening on the ground. Correct? So do you see your role itself as being a mouthpiece for, you know, what exactly is happening on the ground itself? You know, you're, you're giving an unbiased view of the things that's happening. All right. I, I know I'm using a, a very, a, 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 I'm using a kind of like a, a bad word here, which is unbiased, <laughs> because all of us here we are all living with some form of biasness, uh, to a certain degree itself. But do you see yourself as you know by doing so by showing your work to to your followers itself? Um, do you see it as 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 showing a a point of view or uh, that's objective? All right, that you can use to inform your followers on. That's a very interesting question, uh, Leonard, that you've put. And that's the question that I keep asking myself all the time as well. Because, uh, and this question became even more important, uh, again, in the CAA protest that I was doing, you know, as a photojournalist. So again, going back to my uh, education in photojournalism, I started at Hindustan Times. And when I was working there, there were a lot of the photographers who were really hands-on with spot news, you know. And I have to admit, I wasn't as good at them. But what I was really interested in was the storytelling bit, which is where I thought I brought in a certain perspective. You know, I brought in a certain nuance about the people and I brought in the stories of people. When I moved on to working with Reuters and eventually now when I'm working with international publications, one thing that's particularly important for a photojournalist is to be very objective, which kind of brings me back to where I started because here I was talking about there are all these photographers who do a great job with objectivity and perhaps I'm not one of those but as a when I was working at Reuters I was kind of getting trained in doing just that so uh, so when I was covering the CAA protest there was this one incident where uh, you know there was stone pelting happening and uh, first the police practiced a lot of restraint but when the stone pelting went chaotic they kind of had to uh, do a water cannon and then somebody set a car on fire and they had to rush it in and then they were kind of uh, picking up the protesters and you know arresting them and probably hitting them and using force against them so i was i was shooting it for myself but i had a call from one of the editors saying that uh, uh, can you give us some of the photographs and i was like sure i could do that and then I got a call again saying, you know, we hear that the police is being very brutal with these protesters and they're breaking their heads. And for a second, my instinct was, you know, so what? That's what they'll do if the protesters are stone pelting and if they're being very rowdy and if they're being very chaotic about things. And then I had to take a step back. I realized it wasn't my job to judge what was happening there. My job was to shoot. And everything that had happened on the spot, it was my job to be photographing everything, you know. So I think that's a negotiation that keeps happening with us all the time. We're humans. And I think it's very easy for us to be uh, prone to our biases and to forget our position. So it's a constant reminder that we have to give ourselves as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Um, for the rest of the panelists, do you have anything to add on to this question itself? That, uh, or rather this issue that I've actually put up across to Somya? <laughs> so I would say that there's nothing called objectifying. Uh, I am uh, the an output of my filters. You know, I don't know what, you don't know what I read, what, what influences me. And when I click, all that comes into the frame. You like it or you don't like it. You may think you're objective, but you're not. So that's first line for objectivity. The second is the newspapers and magazines were gatekeepers of information in the past era. While yeah. today those gatekeepers are off. So the, every one of us becomes a voice, right? So you cannot call yourself an objective uh, uh, 
photographer and my work through my social media is far more important than someone who is biased than their work through their social media you're equal to them in this global democratized social media world do you want to con- consume that work at all is a question everyone should ask as consumers do you need gatekeepers again in the social media structure now that's a bigger argument and a thought process that needs to happen in the next generation because i don't think yes now i would i would believe for me as well because i think she's ethical i know her i think ashima i know smita i know ritesh all of them are like crazy uh, you know dedicated to truth seekers right but i don't know many new photojournalists and i don't know if i want to believe their work or not i don't know if the work is photo i don't know i don't know i want to know them and if i when i know them i can see their work but then that filter cannot happen but then if the work is being showcased in a particular magazine for example the magazine has come up a lot today national geographic you know so now i know there has been a gatekeeper and the work has gone through someone's eyes and there has been authentic uh, you know practices in place and then i am okay then maybe i am uh, ready to ac- accept or no consume the work not of some of anyone else or not of people i know so that's the problem with social media that there are no more gatekeepers and it's an open world and anybody can speak whatever they want and objectivity takes a back seat because everybody is biased you like it or not either this way or that way maybe i am biased towards truth so even that's a bias you know because i don't think the the country wants to speak the truth or see the truth so okay. so it's a big problem today so i don't know if objectivity is what is objectivity it's like you know it's almost like a matrix scene going on you know is it is it really color we should, or save, not? we should save that for another session you know and that's <laughs> going to be like 5 to 6 hours long yeah no 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 don't yeah. don't get me but, but, uh, i think everybody but, will have some view on this because this is something that everyone deals with every day so it's Definitely. not it's not uh, just my view or english all right uh prasan just just stay, just just stay with me all right because i think i have a question for you which is uh, quite relevant to what you have just uh, shown us uh, during the slide show just now so you know we've seen the the student riots uh, that's happening that that has happened in india itself and currently all right the black life movement in the united states itself so with regards to this how critical do you think that citizens should be documenting their surroundings and actually be aware of what's going on and yeah do you think these footages from from the from the everyday person you know have they become tools of evidence for for this movement itself in the okay so now same the, i think the objectivity thing comes here right the citizen either the victim or the perpetrator there are both citizens now right he could yep. be wearing a government uniform or non government uniform doesn't matter everybody is a citizen or a human being first let's come to a more basic level of just humans fighting okay. humans you know and if I, if i right. go to if you go to the level of uh, sapiens it will be monkeys fighting monkeys so the the point is that we are just uh, documenting each other what okay in its truest form just a video right uh, we without a context without a caption without a you know a, a holistic scenario of what's the political motivation etc 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 uh does not hold the whole story we know that it's just a clip or a photo right now in that photo is, is the photo misused is the photo the again the gatekeepers are not there which is in journalism the same problem there's nobody who's going to authenticate so when you don't authenticate and you just are going to show pictures with you know just off mobile phones there is a problem of uh, shifting views as per the people in control i would not use the word power here let's call it control right at that point of time it could be social media platforms it could be artificial intelligence algorithm it could be ufos coming in brazil i don't know who's controlling but the point is that there is control and that control shifts views right so the we, what we need to do is even for citizen journalism there has to be a gatekeeper some kind of an authentication process if that happens yes what degrees any one of us has in photojournalism do, do we have any degrees in photojournalism we just picked up a camera and walked into the fire you know like abba says you know what is photojournalism you know like uh, uh, pick up uh, wear good shoes and fall in love so you know so it's something like that so we just love, it's not we don't want to go and get get us into trouble it's just we feel the need to photograph and tell a story when something happens and everyone of here would agree to that, that that's that's what motivates us but a citizen journalism person is sitting in between the fire irrespective of him or her uh, wants to be there or not it's something has happened in front of them 
and today we have high quality cameras high quality photography film make uh, for, you know video footage uh, that can be captured and no photojournalist photojournalist can actually reach in time what the citizen journalism uh, journalist may not have is a storytelling capacity but bits and pieces of those videos together can be stitched into a larger narrative and that's the job that maybe a photojournalist or an editor does ultimately so i don't think citizen journalism is actually following the old uh, photojournalistic norm f8 and b there you know if you analyze these lines you no know, it's great it's like if you had a f8 was the lowest aperture in cameras those days and b there is when the bomb blasts you are standing in front of it you know so f8 and b there is photojournalism so you know in a citizen journalist is exactly doing that he's f8 and b there he's right there he or she and ends documenting but then i would say there has to be a filtered level of you know uh, authenticating those videos and photos before it's put out and that's where i think the problem today we face in this you know uh, online world so 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 you find that the issue is trying to authenticate the the actual happenings on the ground itself whether the person on the ground has he or she been actually uh, filming or 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 capturing something that is accurately happening instead of something from the side itself you know just a quick snap run off and then that gets blown out of proportion into a slightly different story is is that what you're trying to is that what you're trying to say yeah i'm trying to say that uh, it there is the 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 spot news photography that's what is citizen journalism that's where it takes away right the the general news the feature news all that you need photojournalists even today the spot news part of it is where we are uh, the citizen journalism has taken over because we could don't reach all spots there is someone else at the spot nobody is going to do okay. the second level of journalism third level of journalism and other things right so those are things that we we all are a part of you know so the spot news is the section where you know we uh we citizen journalism is has taken over full time and it's it's okay it's good actually at some level it's it gives us more insights okay thank you thank you prasanna i think that was that was, that was pretty insightful itself so um now we're actually going to move into the partic- uh, audience questions itself all right so one of the question that i have just give me a minute i'm just going to pull this up so i have a question from pavan all right that i'm going to pose to ashima so pavan actually asked all right if i am not working for a magazine print or media how do i justify my idea to shoot a certain project and actually convince the people that are involved in it um so when you uh, i i am not entirely sure of the question but if they are saying that they want to convince either the, the subject the magazine, i think he's talking about or, the, the subject itself yeah okay um i mean again you know when i started out trying to do a photojournalistic story I didn't have a magazine to back me. I just had work. You know, so if you if you have some work, whatever it is, uh it doesn't have to be of that genre, but just images that you've taken that show people that you have been trying to do photography in whatever level and in whatever genre that you can also show them to show that you are um earnest in some way you are sincere about the fact that you do want to capture the story. um it's i think it's okay honestly you just have to go in and say look this is what i'm trying to do this is who i am this is some of the stuff i've done and uh, and then really take it from there and the good thing with digital cameras is that you can keep showing people you can keep sharing what you're shooting with your subject people get excited um i see it you know all the time when when people see how hard you are working at getting the shot they also are able to give you that much more and i'm not talking about staging i'm just talking about they find points of interest uh with which you can engage and so i don't think when you're starting out you need a magazine to back you or you need any such thing you just need gumption and you need drive and you need to be resourceful because without any of these things you will get nowhere in life in general <laughs> so so these are just you know if you want to do something just go and do it who is stopping you no one just go and do it mm okay okay that's that's so so 
I mean, I, I can I, add to that. Sorry, I, I can add okay. to that. And it's going back to what Ritesh said, you know, about finding balance. Um, I mean, I can speak about this at nauseum because, because I've done many different things in the 20 years that I have been working. And I've done it because I feel that photography for me has been a means of exploration, not just of the world, but of myself and of my experiences and my experimentation and what I want to do in my life. So I didn't know how to make a film. I didn't know how to be a photojournalist. I didn't know how to be a fashion photographer, but I did it because I wanted to do it. And the only way to, to start doing anything is just to start. Um, really, there's, there's no other way to do it. Um, so that's really what I would say is that if you, so life, again, what, what Ritesh said, is the balance. So when, when, when I started moving out of fashion into making a wildlife documentary film, they are quite different, <laughs> you know? Yep. Um, it is very different, yeah. Fashion is very highly constructed. Uh, you have lights, you have assistants, you have stylists, you have everything can be made to be perfect. And then you're going into a situation where you want to make a wildlife documentary where... You know, apart from finding the location and finding people who might know where the animals are at certain times, whatever it is, it's not, it's extremely challenging because you just don't know when, what is going to happen. You know, so nobody was going to pay me to make a wildlife documentary because I was a fashion photographer. So, so you just have to use your, you, you use the money from your fashion projects and put it into where you want to go. And that's the balance. You do your, you do your work for your money and you take it to where you want to go. And then when I did two wildlife films, I wanted to go somewhere else. So then I used the money from that to go. So, you know, it's just, that's how you live your life, I think. So if you want to do something, just do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ashima. So uh, one question that I have uh, from uh, Chetan, all right, that I actually like uh, Smita to actually answer is, uh, well, this is also primarily due to uh, the slideshow, the, the work that are shown during your slideshow itself, all right, about uh, that you have actually documented in Africa itself. So how do you be in control of your own emotions when you are documenting such emotional stuff and yet be able to present this in the images itself? Regarding emotions, right, on the field, yeah. how, do you, um, how do you do the work when you're out there, right? Uh, yeah. that's, that's what you mean. So, uh, well, uh, I've done, uh, I have done quite a few uh, work which, are, which have been very, very heavy uh, on the subject. By subject, I mean the topic and uh, something which is, uh, you know, something which drains energy out of you. Emotionally, it drains you. Physically, you feel, you feel exhausted all the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you're out there on the field, I think objectivity is very important. Why, why are you going where, wherever you are, whichever country, whichever place you are, why are you going there? You know, what is the aim? You know, my, my, I'm here because I have to do this work or I'm here to show, you know, the lives of these people who have been affected by this flood. You know, you're seeing people who are dying out of hunger or whatever affects you right in front of you. Or there, there has been an acid attack and you look at the women and you see flesh, flesh popping out of her skin. You know, you get the smell. And, uh, you know, it's difficult. Such situations are difficult. And uh, I have worked in very uh, uncomfortable and uh, risky situations. Um, I think the first thing is the camera itself is like a shield. You know, when you have the camera in front of you, when you're photographing, it, you almost feel that, you know, what I'm seeing in front of me is not real. You know, it's like a psychology that you have at the back of your mind. You know, you feel okay. Uh, the moment you take the camera off your face and when you look at the scene in front of you, the emotions that you feel is quite different from when you look at it, when you're looking at it from behind a camera. You know? So that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, as photographers, as uh, documentary photographers, as photojournalists, 
when we are out there in the field, we have to get the job done. You know, sometimes you get a grant, you have that much money and you know that, you know, I, I'm traveling there, I'm investing this much time, I'm going there for 10 days, you know, I'm going to be staying in this village. And uh, you come across a lot of things that you're not prepared for. And uh, some, some things might be very uh, uncomfortable for you, you know. Uh, and uncomfortable, I mean, sometimes it can be very uncomfortable physically. For example, uh, this is very weird and I'm bringing this up in this forum. This is slightly deviating from the topic, but when I'm talking about discomfort and how do you keep your focus, for women, you know, there are a lot of things which are very uncomfortable, which can, uh, which can be risky. You know, when you're, uh, you are at a particular place, you're staying in a very shady hotel, um, you know. Uh, I have stayed, uh, you know, in, I've stayed uh, for a couple of nights. I was uh, working on a crime, uh, a crime uh, project, you know, and this is a village of gang uh, of robbers, and I was staying there. And the only decent place that I got to stay was this guest house, a government guest house, so-called guest house, because the moment I entered the room, there were frogs in the room jumping, literally, and there were moles, <laughs> there were moles on the walls, and. And I was, and I was the only person who was living in that place at night. And every night for four hours, they were, the electricity would run out. So it's not very comf forget comfort. It's scary, right? Whatever snake enters the room, you know, you hear the frogs croaking all the time, and there are insects everywhere. You're surrounded by these forests. And what if somebody comes to the room? What if somebody breaks open? There are a lot of things, you know, that you have to prepare yourself. Uh, uh, when you're out there. So uh, it's something else when you're shooting and you're shooting uh, something which is very heavy, which affects you. And it's also something where you have to keep at the back of the back of your mind that how do I protect myself? You know, both emotionally, every, everywhere, how do I protect myself? I'm not sure if I answered really <laughs> exactly, but it's okay. It's okay because I, because I think you know end of the day uh, for for every photojournalist that we have here you know working being being out in the field itself being exposed to different experience itself there there's going to be different types of emotional challenges that all of you are facing and I think the way each of you will try to tackle it all right is is going to be slightly different you know some of you may may choose to tackle emotional challenges head on itself. Some of you may choose to, to tackle emotional challenges on a much more softer and gradual approach. So, so yeah, I, I, think, I think from your answer itself, it seems like, you know, you just try to prepare yourself as much as possible to be emotionally prepared for what you're going to face for the assignment itself when you're going to be out in the field. So you sort of prime your mind to be in, in a specific uh, mindset. And then when you get there, so whatever that's being thrown at you itself, you know, you, you, you feel like you have actually been prepared for that. Is, 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 that, is that what you're trying to say as well, Smita? Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, there, there are sometimes there are very simple things that, uh, uh, that might affect you uh, when, when you are uh, working. For example, as women, you know, uh, the access to toilets becomes very difficult when you're out sometimes out you're out for 18 hours you are at a location where uh, you know there are hardly any toilets uh, what do you do you still have to do your job so there are a lot of things that you might face uh, you know that you have to prepare yourself for right? how do you deal okay. with different situations okay Thank you, thank you, Smita. I think I think that was quite. I think that's going to be some uh, good answers for for the participants itself to actually digest and actually well prepare themselves. You know, if they choose to enter into the field of photojournalism uh, as a career, um, some of you may have noticed that the the panelists that we have tonight, you know, the group of panelists that we have tonight, is a little bit unique. All right. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to show how unique it is with this question from um, one of the participants itself. All right. So we have a question that's directed to Ashima, Smita, and Somya itself. All right. So I think you guys can see, you know, uh, where this question is actually headed. So um, the participant has actually not indicated uh, 
his or her name itself, but um, he or she was asking, could you please share some of your personal struggle at work as a woman? You know, uh, and would like to know the disadvantage and advantage of being a women photojournalist. So, of course, you know, there's no, there's no other better people to answer this than Ashima, uh, Somya and Smita itself. So, uh, maybe, maybe Ashima, could you just share with us a little bit about uh, this, this uh, question that I've just put up? Uh, yes. First, I would like to address your uh, question about Ritesh's being an unpaid intern. And I just wanted to ask, did anybody not start as an unpaid intern? Because I, I didn't even know that was a possibility. <laughs> so uh, maybe Ashima, could you just share with us you know, some, of, um, some of the personal struggle that you have at work um, as a woman itself? I mean, this is coming from one of the participants. I mean, really, to be honest, um, I came, so I, whatever, I moved to Bombay when I was 17 uh, and I stayed in a government uh, girls hostel and, you know, I was going to college. I came to Bombay for college. My parents weren't there or whatever. But I think uh, from that age onwards, everything was a struggle because just uh, living normally, uh, was just you know there were things that one would not have faced if they were men you know so but you so you don't really you start not to think about these things when you go into work because they just happened and it was just part of life like honestly i used to stay in a hostel it was there were like 500 girls in the hostel and apparently the idea of having 500 girls in a building is so exciting to many people that there would be men who used to come outside our gate and start jerking off. There was a guy who used to come at four o'clock every day opposite our window on the terrace and jerk off. You know, it was just like, that was what happened. There would be, you'd be on the bus, there would be somebody who'd be like pushing his erect penis into your leg. You know, it's just, these are things that happen. And this started happening at a very young age. So... When by the time you start working at 23, 24, you know, you're not even thinking about it anymore. Yeah? It's just like whatever, you know, it's happening, it's happened, you don't think about it. I mean, honestly, this is, I'm also of an older generation. So these are things that were happening and everyone was facing it. Everyone, all my peers faced it. So you don't talk about it. And when it happens in work, you don't talk about it because it's just, you just have to move on and you just progress. So I think it's really great that the younger people do talk about these types of things. But honestly, so much of the stuff has happened that I don't even remember it, to be really honest. So I can't, I can't really answer this question with, uh, with the kind of, I think, incidences that you want me to talk about because I don't mm. remember them, to be All right. honest. But, sure, no <laughs> problem. Um, Somia, do you have anything to, you know, that, that you can add to this question itself? You know, is, is there any personal struggles or, or do you see any advantages, you know, being a women photojournalist itself? Uh, I think the problems and advantages of being a woman photojournalist or operating on the field are pretty much a reflection of the society that we work in, you know. And in those ways, uh, we just have to... Uh, admit that India in particular does not have a great reputation. Uh, I remember when I had start, when I, uh, you know, got my first job and that was also the time whenever there was a vacancy in a publication, I could, I, you know, you can take my word for it. If they wanted a photographer, they wanted a male photographer, unless specified that they're looking for a woman photographer, the chances of a woman photographer getting hired were very bleak. You know, so I always said that there are two kinds of photographers. One's a photographer and the other is a woman photographer, you know. And then the number of times that I've been sat down by, you know, uh, like senior colleagues and been told that, you know, it's, it's not a woman's profession. It's a profession for man because tomorrow you're going to be married. You're going to have kids. You can't just wake up in the morning and rush for an assignment. So those things have always been there. But, uh, but there are also the kind of advantages, you know, uh, in a society like India, 
people are very trusting of women we are very harmless people you know so while people will be very might be reluctant in accepting men into their homes and into their stories they're okay with accepting women uh, one of my friends uh, told me that if you're ever asked what's your strength as a photojournalist you should say it's your big bladder <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, i can go 8 hours without using the toilet <laughs> i think that's one of the uh, biggest advantages in in this profession in a country like ours where you know a basic facility like clean bathrooms are very uh, rare if you're moving to towards the rural part of the country so uh, yeah these things yeah uh, this has helped me really yeah i think i think we've all perfected that bladder bladder issue <laughs> so i i just want to add to this bladder issue yes, which please. which i mentioned before you know the lack of toilets when you're out on the field so um uh, was it last year? okay so 2018 you know i started working on a very long long term assignment uh, i'm not going to get into the details of the assignment or the publication sure but uh, i had to travel to a lot of places in the rural areas and i had to be on the field and while i was working on the field i found out i was pregnant so uh, i i called my editor and the first thing that i was scared was shit maybe i will lose this assignment you know so as a woman the first thing is that uh, i i know like a lot of women photographers who are mothers uh you know they they have told me especially i remember Lin, lincy adario you know i i happened to uh, i mean uh, i was at the icp infinity awards at some uh, at one of the years and uh, where she was presenting and she was uh, one of the speakers and she was talking about her life and then she said that while she was on an she was working on various uh, assignments she was in afghanistan she was also in india at that point of time and she totally hid about her pregnancy from the editors because she thought she would not get a job you know so the first thing is that as women you know things as basic as uh, as toilets or the bigger things you know you're having a baby these comes in the way of your work often and you are scared you you don't know what to do how to deal with this because i had to deal with a lot of anxiety i had to deal with a lot of dangers and risk because i decided to work on the project and i told my editor that don't take it away from me you know and she said no absolutely not and i was completely given a lot of support i was given an assistance to help me carry the heavy bag you know and uh, i managed to complete that assignment and i worked almost till the 8th month of my pregnancy you know uh, and um, so these are things that men don't have to deal with but women have to deal with and uh, when you talk about the bladder when you are pregnant you have to pee sometimes 25 times a day you know so and i was working in bangladesh i was working in the sundarbans i was working in these areas and i had to go and knock on random people's houses with my big belly and then the first thing is that can i use your toilet you know so i i i face such situations and i think lot of women do okay this 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 can i narrate a lighter story in the early days of my internship people used to you know i used to be the photographer's assistant on a cricket match especially those long five day cricket matches or three day cricket matches um and there'd be like somebody who'd run from the office and come back with another stack of rolls and his job was to take the earlier sessions roll back uh, and my job was to go uh, the moment there's a coffee tea break lunch break and all those breaks i have to be there at least 10 minutes before the break i have to block a toilet so that we can you know go inside do the transfer of film etc so you'd see like you know six or seven of these toilets especially blocked out just for photographers all we're doing is inside is changing film and loading another one and you know sending it back so i mean i'm i'm, uh, I'm sorry for the spectators who would come there but you know we needed those toilets uh, we we we're happy to have you back with Tash as well like i mentioned just now because so we, have a, we, we have a we have a we have a question that i think um uh kind of relates back to you but then but now i realize that you know uh, pretty much everyone here was an unpaid intern at some point of time but uh um, mm. with Tash maybe you could just help out um Kabir on this as well so Kabir actually asked you know um i want to pursue photojournalism as a full time career 
and uh, mm-hmm. and it's and and the graduation will be uh, end of next year. So I've thought of joining Udan School of Photography after graduation because I've seen many photojournalists in Bombay doing well after graduating from there. So um, mm-hmm. Kabir is asking for your suggestion and whether photojournalism is a good full-time career because uh, he really wants to do it. So maybe the first thing you can help um, Kabir to, to address is, you know, um, by going to, to a school, uh, by going to the Udan School of Photography and all that, you know, do you feel that that's the right track to pursue photojournalism itself? I mean, if you have the money, why not, you know, and if, if you can learn a few tricks, like how to present your work, how to talk about your work, this is something that I didn't know before, you know, 2017, 18. And I learned it by going into the deep end, you know, when you're, when you're sitting with a stack of books, what are you going to do? How are you going to talk about it? Uh, if you have the money, go for it. And, uh, you know, it, it's very romantic. It's, it's very, it's very, uh, cool when I say that, oh, you know, I started as an unpaid intern and things like that. It's not very easy, though. It's not very easy to pull it off, especially I started at the time of film. And, you know, I had to procure my own film. I had to get my own camera. I even had my own, like, my office didn't give me a digital camera. I had to upgrade it myself. So, you know, um, I'm sorry to say, but a large part of photojournalism today is coming in from, um, you know, a reasonably influential, you know, class reasonably, you know, uh, you have to be, you have to be of a certain economic background to survive in this profession, especially now when things have worsened so much. Um, so if you want to join a newspaper, by all means, do whatever it takes. You know, in my case, I, I stayed there for seven months till the time they didn't give me a job. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's feasible if you can pull it off. But uh, okay. along with my internship, I also did two other jobs to supplement, you know, to take care of the other income. So, uh, I mean, so okay. it entirely depends on where you're coming from and what you wish to achieve from it. Mm-hmm. So, well, the, the second part of Kabir's question, <laughs> all right, is that uh, is photojournalism a, a good full-time career? Because uh, he really wants to do it. So what, what, what would be your... What would be your, your feedback to him? Um, any career is good if you keep reinventing yourself to a certain degree. You know, I mean, if, like if you stay with a magazine for 10 years, if you do that same kind of thing for like 15 years, 20 years, you, you know, it may or may not work out. But I feel that, uh, yeah, man, it's what you make of that career. It's not really, you know, it's not the career telling you <laughs> that I'm good. Come. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Ritesh. Thank you so much. And um, I'd like to thank everyone. I mean, uh, Ashima, Ashima seems, uh, mentioned that, you know, in the chat box itself, she needs to log off soon itself. Sorry. And of course, thank, yeah. thank you to Shmita, yeah. Somya, Prasant, and uh, Ritesh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, before we end, I'd like to hand over back to uh, Vijay himself. Uh, he has a couple of words to add before we end today's session. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a big thank you for all the panelists. Really, I mean, it's, it's such an enlightening um, session. In, in fact, I learned so much about photojournalism. When you, um, when you actually uh, uh, look at these images from now on, instead of just consuming it, I am, I'm really going to admire the images that all the photojournalists are going to post there. It's thank you so much. And, and uh, to, to the entire... Um, uh, uh, audience. Now, uh, as I said, that we will probably uh, put up a, a contest at the end of the session. And this contest, probably I should also say that it's slightly um, a kind of inspiration that I got from uh, Ritesh uh, while uh, beginning of the week we were talking about it. Now, the entire audience, the, the contest is this. <laughs> How about each of you uh, do a feature about covering a family? that has been hit by the current COVID situation in your neighborhood and, and uh, probably post each of the images uh, to create a story. We will give you about 10 days time to create that story. Uh, we will also email you the entire uh, uh, framework of how it needs to be done. And we would, the winning image, we might ask you to give us a small BTS video as well of, of how you covered it. So the winning image will will get a 25,000 rupees cash grant. And again, with this, the family that you're going to cover that, that really has been affected because of this uh, COVID, 
we will also from srishti's fund we will help them out so let's see how much how many people have come out of my nice stories from there thank hey, we you we forgot to talk about consent you know you the, the person who takes these photographs they have to have the consent of the family to you know be posting these pictures and things also, lovely yeah. yeah also another thing that i'd like to put out there is that these are particularly unsafe times to be shooting yeah, so be please safe, man. make sure that you are safe please take all the precautions wear your mask wear your gloves and do not fall sick because 25000 rupees will not pay your hospital bills lovely good uh, somya thank you for saying thank that thank you <laughs> so thank you and and uh, and um, thank you once again and uh, to all the panelists and have a great um, weekend thank you